Okay, so um, we're starting on um, our final novel, and I'm very glad it's, it's Faulkner. Um, there's so many stories to tell about Faulkner, just about the composition of the novel. Um, so this started out having a different title. Um, it started out being called Dark House, so you can see that it really is right on the other side of the spectrum. Um, and it's really interesting to think that actually this novel could be described as either Dark House um, or Light in August. So really, Light and Dark obviously are the two constitutive parts of the novel, even though it's the light that is being highlighted in the present title. Um, in fact, it could just as well have been dark. Um, this is what Faulkner says about um, the title that we now have, Light in August. Um, this is much later, um, he, um, when he was talking about it at um, the University of Virginia in 1957. In August in Mississippi, there's a few days somewhere about the middle of the month when actually this foretaste of fall is cool, there's a lambent, a luminous quality to the light, as though it came not from today, but from back in the old classic times, in my fonts and satires and the gods from Greece. And that's all that the title meant. It was just to me a pleasant, evocative title because it reminded me of that time of a luminosity older than our Christian civilization. Maybe the connection is with Lena Grove, who had something of that pagan quality. This is a great um, entry point to the novel um, is about the quality of light in Mississippi. So it has a very important local dimension to it. But it also is, sees itself as completely um, looking back to an extremely long literary tradition going back to the classic times. Um, and in fact, it predates Christianity. So that's very important. Um, to consider as well is that Christianity is very, very important in this novel. Um, but it's very important to remember that Faulkner actually also has a reference point that is older than Christianity. So um, because Faulkner was talking about fonts and satires, just, you know, I mean, I think that those words are just words to most of us. So I just found some um, illustrations. This is from the Roman mosaics, um, the satire. Um, so you can see basically it's a hu uh, like human beings except the hooves, the feet are uh, the hooves of a goat. Um, so that's really the, this is a f not a very pretty um, image of the fawn. I think that in our minds we tend to think of the fawn as very delicate and graceful, um, but actually it has kind of an animalistic dimension to it. Um, and this is a more probably looking more like our stereotypical image of the form, very graceful, uh, but nonetheless with the hooves of a goat. So um, in uh, As I Lay Dying, we talk a lot about the relation between animals and humans. Um, so it's very important to keep that in mind as well, just in the reference um, to the form. Faulkner is uh, invoking that whole uncertain boundary um, and so then in between us, between human and animal. Um, and as the satire actually has the even longer history, if the form basically is Roman, um, satire has the, it goes back to the fifth century BC, basically is Greek. And there's a whole genre called a satire comedy f featuring this creature. Um, it's again, looking for the most part like a human being, um, but having the tail of a horse and also the ears of a donkey. Um, just to see the way in which the satire has been uh, reactivated and picked up and reincarnated in the 20th century. Here is someone <laughs> with the ears of a satire, right? You know, we call them the Vulcan's ears, but looking exactly like the ears uh, of the satire. Uh, and here is another image, basically the ears are the giveaway um, of this creature. Also it's small, um, very, not very noble looking um, compared to a human being or to a god. Um, so, but Faulkner, even though he's interested in the satire and the forms, he's not really writing about them. He's mostly interested in Lena um, and the fact that she is a pagan character to him. 
so more on Lena. She was never ashamed of that child, whether it had any father or not. She was simply going to the conventional laws of the time and find its father. But as far as she was concerned, she didn't especially need any father for it any more than the women that, on whom Jupiter begot children were anxious for a home and a father. So father seems to be really interested in women who get pregnant out of wedlock, right? We've seen this um, in As I Lay Dying, in Dewey Dow, um, and um, the, the kind of the way in which that is the constant burden on her mind. Um, and it seems that he now has gone to the other side of the spectrum. Um, if pregnancy <laughs> was a constant burden on Dewey Dow's mind here, it appears that it is not a burden at all on Lena's mind, and maybe that's why she's a pagan, um, is that it's completely okay to be pregnant out of wedlock, not to have a father, not to have a wedded father um, as the father of your child. Um, and the reason that is the case is that Jupiter has had this long history of having father many children, um, who can point to Jupiter as the father, Jupiter or Zeus, um, as the father, but otherwise not having a human father. So it's a completely honorable thing to have a baby when you don't know who the father is. And the most famous example, of course, is someone called Leda, right? So you guys know I'm picking two very chaste illustrations of Leda and the swan, the swan being Zeus, obviously. Um, but you can, if you would just go and look it up, you can find numerous other <laughs> illustrations that I'm not so chaste, uh, showing Lita and the swan. And this is the most famous example. Um, Lita was married to someone else, and so was just was enamored of her. So he comes to her in the form of a swan. Um, and the offspring, one of the most famous offspring from that union was Helen. So basically, the whole of the Iliad, the whole of the Odyssey, really comes from this union between Leda and Zeus. Um, and there would have been no epic at all if that had not been this um, union between Leda and someone who's not quite human. Um, so here's another illustration. This one is uh, Greek, and this one is Roman, once again, Roman mosaic, um, and many modern incarnations as well. Um, Yeats also has a poem uh, about Leda. So basically, someone who goes down in history um, as um, a kind of, um, if, if, even though it's not presented in this way, but she's really going down in history um, as the most honorable instance of pregnancy outside of wedlock. Um, so, but Faulkner is also not writing Lena's story either, right? He's writing Lena's story. So this is very much a case of Lena updating the American Lena, updating the Greek Lena, um, even though maybe she didn't, doesn't know the father, or maybe you know, she's not sure that she can get the legitimate wedded husband to be the father of the child. She's definitely going to go and, and you know, she's going to get someone. So it was her destiny to have a husband and children, and she knew it. And so she went out and attended to it, completely matter of fact. You know, this is the American case. It's not the old classic times anymore. In 20th century America, you need to find a guy. So um, she's on the road um, to find this guy uh, whom she still <laughs> thinks is thought to be the, the actual father. So um, today's lecture is really about the updating of, um, of, of this, the old classic um, wet mother, and um, this is the structure of today's lecture, the way that I've been talking about it, obviously you know that this is going to be a comedy on the part of Lena. So it's comedy and especially sex is comic, um, but because this is a road novel, one of the many, um, it also has an epic dimension to it. Um, and another innovation that Faulkner um, is bringing to bear on the novel, and that really is a serious uh, updating of the classic epic comedy um, is the introduction of two allegorical names, Byron and Burden. So, um, but just, just let, um, I want to go back still, just linger with the, the classics for a moment. 
um, in d defining comedy in a particular way. Usually we just think of comedy as, you know, like a Jane Austen, you know, that would be comedy, um, has a happy ending. Uh, but actually, um, in the poetics, Aristotle defines uh, comedy in a slightly different way that actually is closer to the way that I would like to talk about comedy in this class. In the poetics, he says, the participants in comedy we call commodoi not from the being revelers, but because they wander from one village to another. So wandering on the road. Pe persons who are inferior not, however, going all the way to full villainy, but imitating the ugly of which the ludicrous is one part. The ludicrous, that is, is the failing of or a piece of ugliness which causes no pain or destruction. This is a very counterintuitive definition of comedy. It, a lot of it is, is not that nice. You know, it has to do with villainous people, but not going all the way to full villainy. Ugly people, but again, not going all the way, so they're, they're utterly despicable. It has a lot to do with people who are not noble, and that really is the classic definition of comedy. The emphasis really less on um, the happy ending than on the fact that they are low-born, um, that they are low in every other way, that they don't rise to the to the tragic height of nobility, which is the elevation proper to um, to to tragedy, um, comedy is of a much lower elevation. Um, so they are sometimes ludicrous. Um, they are basically not admirable people. Um, but as one result of not being completely admirable, is that they actually survive quite well. They actually manage to um, you know to hang in there um, so they bring no pain or destruction either to themselves or to other people once again this is the exact opposite of tragedy we have mass destruction at the end of tragedy if we think about the tragedy of Troy of all the tragedies based on the story of Troy mass destruction here um, a comedy suggests that everyone is going to be able to survive so um, with that definition in mind, um, let's think about the ways in which Lena is pagan, especially in relation to her sexuality um, and the way the Faulkner represents this aspect of hum the human condition. Um, this is the story of how Lena uh, gets pregnant. She slept in the lean-to room at the back of the house. It had a window she learned to open and close again in the dark without making noise. She had lived there eight years before she opened the window for the first time. She had not opened it a dozen times hardly before she discovered that she should not have opened it at all. She said to herself, that's just my luck. Two weeks later, she climbed again through the window. It was a little difficult this time. If it had been this hard to do before, I reckon I would not be doing it now, she thought. So the entire story, you know, this what could have been seen as tragic, traumatic, kind of devastation in one person's life, one person's life being ruined, all of that is told through Lena's relation to the window, um, that she can open it without making a noise, that she's done it a few times, and then she realized that she shouldn't have done it, and then final time, it's really hard. Uh, but it, she wished that it had been that hard to begin with. So it's all told through this completely off-focus, <laughs> off-center relation to the main event. And is, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem especially bad, really, you know, even though it's a matter of inconvenience. And that really is what the pregnancy is to Lena. It is a matter of inconvenience. It's a nuisance <coughs> that it's not so easy for her to get out the window at this time. Um, and just to remind us that Faulkner doesn't always write about sexuality in this way. Let's just go back to a character who's completely non-pagan, and there's none other, um, more, no more striking example than Quentin um, in The Sound of the Fury. Um, so this is what he thinks about women's sexuality, delicate equilibrium of periodic filth. 
between two moons balance. Moons, he said, full and yellow as harvest moons, the hips, thighs, liquid petrifaction, like drawn things, floating like pale rubber, flabbily filled, getting the odor of honeysuckle all mixed up. So for Quentin and indeed for most non-pagan uh, characters, there's a good part of the world that is repugnant, that is just really repulsive. Um, and it turns out that women's sexuality is part of that very repugnant uh, world. And so it's not great to live in a world like that. And that's really why Quentin does what he does. Um, for someone like Lena, who is pagan, um, much of the world, in fact, probably all of the world, it's not repugnant, you know, it's inconvenient, sometimes it's a little ugly, a little messy, but it's not repugnant. And that's why she is what she is. Um, so, on, so this is one way we can think about Lena, and I should tell you that she's not the only character. So this novel is actually not that comic, but her share of the novel is comic in, in that way. But um, even though Aristotle defines comedy as, um, as basically the journey um, that is undertaken by ignoble persons. The more recognizable model, obviously, is the epic journey, right? So anytime we think of someone traveling on the road, we think of the epic genre. Um, and that is very much in play. We've seen it in play elsewhere in Faulkner. It's very much in play here as well. Um, and this is actually a kind of not so funny uh, kind of, it's interesting to see what the tone of this is, um, of description of Lena being on the road. Though the muse plot in a steady and unflagging hypnosis, the vehicle does not seem to progress like a shabby beat upon the mild red string of road. So much so is this that in the watching of it, the eye loses it as sight and sense drowsily merge and blend, like the road itself with all the peaceful and monotonous changes between darkness and day, like already measured thread being rewound onto a spool. So that at last, as though out of some trivial and unimportant <laughs> region beyond even distance, the sound of it seems to come slow and terrific and without meaning, as though it were a ghost traveling a half mile ahead of its own shape. Great description. Um, and it's, um, it's on a different register. We can see that it's really on a different tonal register from Lena having trouble climbing out the window. Um, and I would say that, that the, there's a complicated relation between the epic genre and the comic genre in this novel. On the whole, uh, what the epic genre brings to this novel um, is the sense of, some of, of a journey that simply has to go on. Um, is not even especially um, pleasurable. Um, it just stretches on um, yesterday, to think more in terms of the paradigm that we've been using, um, tomorrow is going to be exactly like today and going to be exactly like yesterday. It's the same repetition of the same um, that defines um, this kind of epic journey. So it is peaceful and monotonous, and the image that Faulkner uses is that it's like already measured thread being rewound onto a spool, right? There's absolutely nothing new under the sun. It is just an old story being told over and over again, um, and um, the complete um, exclusion of anything that is dramatic from this sense of the journey. Right? So it's, in many ways, it's very hard to write a novel based on the fact that it's completely monotonous. And that's part of the challenge, although you know, I promise you, the rest of the novel actually is anything but monotonous. But um, Lena's part of it actually aspires to be monotonous in a good sense, in the sense that there's really, um, it's good you know, that there's no dramatic development, there's no catastrophe. That's really what Faulkner has at the back of his head is that catastrophe is what defines tragedy. Non-catastrophe is what defines comedy. So um, just to um, give you a sense of the way in which this epic journey is being incarnated and reincarnated in American literature to other very famous novels, 
Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and more recently, um, this apocalyptic instance of that, uh, Colin McCarthy, The Road. Um, Faulkner's On the Road um, is a little different from those two. Um, so today we'll think about all the ingredients that go into his making of his road novel. Um, has to do with kindness of strangers. Um, has to do with something like switchability. Um, if the journey is going to be pretty monotonous for Lena, um, there's got to be some variation, right? It has to alternate with something else. So it turns out that actually, even though the protagonist herself is too peaceful for the story to be very dramatic, um, there will be other people, the supporting cast actually, will supply the drama. So there's a kind of a switchability between um, where the action or where the drama is going to come from. As far as Lena is concerned, the drama is going to come from the supporting cast rather than from Lena herself. Um, and there's a further switchability um, in terms of the relation between the weighty and the mundane, and then I'll talk about Jurens as well, so it's the outline of what is to come. Uh, but let's just stay with the kindness of strangers uh, for a little bit. Um, Lena has come quite far, um, and the reason um, that the journey is so peaceful and monotonous is that there's an endless supply of people who would do things for her, right? who would be the suppliers of hospitality um, to keep Lena uh, going. And that too is very Greek. We know that hospitality is one of the key virtues um, in Greek culture, that when a stranger comes, you're supposed to feed them, uh, shelter them, give them presents when they go away. Um, that is the understanding, the basic mode of exchange between human beings is that you're good to people you see for the first time and that you never see again. Um, so there's the quality, there's something of that in the way that Lena is being treated. Um, the evocation of far is a peaceful corridor paved with unflagging and tranquil faith and people with kind and nameless faces and voices. Lucas Bush, I don't know, I don't know anybody by that name around here. This road, it goes to Pocahontas. He might be there, it's possible. Here's a wagon that's going a piece of the way. It will take you that far. So these people are completely faceless and nameless. They really are complete strangers. They're not meant to be remembered or to be encountered again, um, even though Faulkner sometimes actually picks up some of them in his other novels. Um, but they're meant to recede into the background as part of that peaceful and monotonous corridor on which it is completely safe for Lena to travel, right? So it's the sense of guaranteed safety due to the guaranteed hospitality of strangers. But um, we know that it's the kindness of strangers has got to take a dramatic turn uh, for there to be a good story <laughs> into the novel. So we're actually seeing it very soon. Um, and it comes about um, through Lena's interaction with a couple. She's being um, taken in by this couple. Um, and it turns out that the arrival of Lena creates a major upheaval in the life of this married couple. So all of a sudden, Lena recedes into the background. So, you know, we can also, to the switchability, we can also add the switchability between foreground and background. Lena recedes into the background as the supporting cast comes to the foreground. So this is the exchange between the armsters. He cannot tell from her voice if she's watching him or not now. He towers himself with a split flower set. Maybe she will. If he's running away from her, he's after. I reckon he's going to find out he made a bad mistake when he stopped before he put the Mississippi River between them. And now he knows that she's watching him. The gray woman, not plump and not thin. Man hard, work hard. In a serviceable gray garment, one savage and brass. Her hands on her hips, her face like those of generals who have been defeated in battles. You men, she says. What do you want to do about it? Turn her out? Let her sleep in the barn, maybe? You men, she says. You darn men. So this is 
all we're going to, I mean, we'll get one more, a little bit more of this. But this is really, um, for, as far as Faulkner is concerned, this is completely adequate, freestanding snapshot of the marriage. Um, and I would say that it is as interesting as the marriage um, between Cora and her husband and Tao, um, except that it's, sort of, it's at, at the moment of tension between the two. So we know that what kind of people these are, they're the poor white women more, right? People who would wear, who would can afford a towel and would use a split flower sack for a towel. Um, and the, rate, the way that they actually know each other very well. So um, Armstead doesn't have to look, this is the Armsteads. Um, Armstead doesn't have to look um, usually to see if she's watching him or not. Right? I mean, it really says a lot about what kind of a relationship um, it is that you can just tell by the tone of voice whether or not the other person is looking at you. So that for me is a measure of how good the marriage is, is that you know, you know your companion that well. Just the tone of voice will be able to tell you exactly the posture, the physical posture um, of this person. Um, so initially he can't really tell, um, but then um, once he says something, once he said, okay, you know, that this guy is not going to be able to escape from Lena, once he said that, then she knew instantly that she's looking at him. Um, and we know what she looks like, um, sort of a, 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 a more stern version, I think, of Eddie, um, but pretty much, very much belonging to the same socioeconomic group um, in a gray garment, um, working hard all her life, but also not just work hard and all these interesting coined adjectives coined by uh, Faulkner, man hard, I don't exactly know what that means. Man hard is just that maybe she's completely resistant to the charms of men. Maybe that's one, one definition of what it means to be man hard. Um, certainly she's worked hard all her life. Um, and maybe the two adjectives are related in that way. There's a way in which you know, if you work so hard um, all your life, you're kind of immune to the charms of other people, men and women. Um, so she is immune to the charms of her husband. Um, and her face is like the face of generals who've been defeated in battle. Um, it is a weird reference. Um, it is not, you know, the Civil War is really not important um, in this, well, no, actually, the Civil War is very, very important to another character, but it's not important to Lena. Um, the Civil War is front and center for another character, but it oddly intrudes into this moment when it really is not the reference point. Um, but the entire history of the South is indexed in this reference of Mrs. Armstead's face looking like um, the face of General. So she's, in many ways, she's more like a man um, than like a woman. Um, I know there's actually um, that when, when I came to, to this section uh, last week, and I enjoyed them very much, some of you mentioned that Nicole is, is financially uh, more like a man, and so is Rosemary. Rosemary is financially more like a man. So Fitzgerald has also thought about the ways in which there could be a cross-gender dynamics in people who are otherwise completely feminine. Um, and here, she doesn't look especially feminine, and the cross-gender dynamics um, much, much more uh, powerful here. So she's like a general who's been defeated in battle. Maybe she's been defeated in life, just because it's been such a hard life, although you know that, uh, um, or, or just that you know that it didn't go exactly the way she wanted. Um, we don't know the contents of that phrase that you know that why her face is like the face of generals who have been defeated. Um, we also don't know, but that's the least of it. We don't know why she's suddenly saying what she's saying to her husband, "You darn man." Um, Armstead is really not contemplating having an affair with Lena, right? So the Durham man is not really a complaint against her husband. It is a grievance that is probably directed against the entire, you know, 
half of the human population, men, um, that this is what men would do to women. Um, and her husband being an instance of that, although you know, obviously there are many other episodes in the marriage who might, that might be at the back of her mind. But in any case, this completely out of the blue, out of context, outburst from Mrs. Armstead suggests that this is both a very good marriage, but also a complicated marriage, as all marriages would have to be, right, if they've lasted for a long time. So these two people know each other very well. Um, and he seems to know, he knows better than we do exactly what is going on in her mind when she says, you do it, man. Um, and then there's um, a further development to this episode. Um, she's actually, now this, we're getting dramatic action from Mrs. Armstead. What are you fixing to do with your egg money this time of night, he says. I reckon it's mine to do with what I like. She stoops into the lamp, her face hush, bitter. God knows it was me who sweated over them and nursed them. You never lifted no hand. Sure, he says. I reckon it ain't any human in this country is going to dispute them hands with you. Lesson is the possums and his snakes. That rooster bang, neither, he says, because stooping suddenly, she jerks off one shoe and strikes the china bang, a single shattering blow. From the bed, reclining, Armstead watches her gather the remaining coins from among the china fragments and drop them with the others into the sack and nodded and re -nodded three or four times with savage finality. Um, <laughs> this is one of the most satisfying representations of almsgiving of people being charitable and looking completely not charitable when they're doing it, right? So this is the only way this woman would allow herself um, to be charitable is by looking as harsh and bitter as she could. Um, so uh, uh, before that, Armstead had thought, well, you know, maybe she's just into kind of a jealous mood and, you know, just gonna not allow Lena to stay in the house. But it turns out that it's quite the opposite. Um, and it's probably it's a kind of very com 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 complex combination of recognizing that, yes, this is a young woman, very attractive, um, that she's not that young woman, very attractive. Um, but recognizing maybe in some sense um, that, you know, she also, that this woman is embodying uh, a long nurse grievance that she has against men in general, whatever the, the psychology. Um, she is in solidarity um, with Lena without ever wanting to betray that solidarity, right? So it is that complicated kind of behavior um, that you want to do something for that person, but you never want to give yourself a way of doing something. Um, so it, it, it really is the, uh, the most interesting and dramatic and psychologically and behaviorally complicated kind of kindness of strangers um, is that it's not, definitely not, the traditional kind of almsgiving. So in terms of the narrative dynamics, we can say that the armsters have completely taken over the narrative, right? There's a complete switch between Lena, the supposed protagonist, um, and the two of them being the supporting cast. It turns out that the supporting cast, that Faulkner probably spends more time thinking about the supporting cast than he does thinking about the protagonist. And that is a really interesting way to define the protagonist, is that maybe the protagonist is someone you can actually afford not to spend a lot of time thinking about, and that it is really the supporting cast that you have to give your energy to. It's a very the interesting definition of reversibility, of the distribution of space, distribution of attention um, within the story. Um, and we've seen many instances of this, so um, just to, because we've, we're just done with Fitzgerald, just want to remind you of a very obvious instance of switchability in Tenderest the Night, um, in the description of Nicole 
that her brown bag is hanging from the pearls, right? So if the human body is hanging from the appendage, um, a completely switch, uh, reverse degree of importance between the person who's supposed to the protagonist and uh, what is supposed to be just an appendage. And of course, that switchability is played out not only in terms of that one particular detail, but also in terms of the entire narrative of Tenderest the Night. It turns out that Dick Diver is completely upstaged by Nicole um, as she becomes really the main actor um, in the novel, that it is, becomes her story, that she gets to dictate the outcome of that story. And he becomes her appendage, and dispensable appendage uh, at the end of the novel. So um, we've, we've seen this in Faulkner um, basically on a very large macro scale in terms of the entire narrative structure of Tendrils the Night. In Faulkner, it's much more local. It is just this one moment um, that there's a switch relation between protagonist and supporting cast. Um, but, it also, and, but it also plays out in, on different registers in Tendrils the Night. Uh, uh, light in August. So we'll look at one other also local instance of switchability. Um, and this is the sort of non, if the arms that represent the kind of the dramatic arm of the novel, where Faulkner can give us high human psychological drama. Um, wh when it comes to Lena, he, what he gives us is um, kind of very small upheavals on what is basically a level platform, but even on that very level of platform, um, there are mild upheavals, and it has to do with the switchability between the weighty and the mundane. So she seems to muse upon the mounting road while the slow spitting and squatting men watch her covertly, believing that she is thinking about the man and the approaching crisis, when in reality she is waging a mild battle with the providential caution of the old earth of and with and by which she lives. This time, she conquers. She rises and walking a little awkwardly, a little carefully, she traverses the rank battery of man eyes and enters the store, the clerk following. I'm going to do it, she thinks, even while ordering the cheese and crackers. I'm going to do it, saying aloud. And a box of sardines. She calls them sardines. So this is the essence of the drama in the to be or not to be, or in this case, to do or not to do, the to do or not to do uh, in Lena's consciousness revolves around a box of sardines. And that is completely okay for Faulkner. It qualifies her to be the protagonist of um, his novel. So we really um, have to give some thought to what it is that entitles um, a person to be the protagonist of a novel. We know that in Greek tragedy, a person has to be noble and has to have a very drastic downfall in order to qualify to be the hero of a tragedy. Um, in the modern comic novel, nothing like that. Just a very, very minor upheaval um, is okay. So, um, it, and it's, I think that it is because of that very level platform, because of that basic, very reliable continuum that is uh, backed up, supported uh, by the kindness of strangers. It's because of that continuum that we get a really interesting linguistic practice, a kind of a stylistic tick almost um, in this particular novel. There is Maybe some, we've seen a little bit of that in the other novels, but in this novel it's really pronounced. Uh, it has to do with the use of germs, especially turning verbs into nouns. We've seen a little bit of that earlier in the passage, but here it becomes this in the foreground. Um, that far within my hearing, before my seeing, I will be riding within the hearing of Lucas Bush before his seeing. He will hear the wagon, but he won't know. So there will be one within his hearing before his seeing. And then he will see me, and he will be excited. And so there will be two within his seeing before his remembering. Like highly stylized. Um, basically, there's no way we can not notice um, the fact that the verbs are being used as nouns in this instance. 
Um, so th the way that we can maybe try to make sense of this very um, self-conscious practice on thoughtless part is by noticing how different an image of Lucas Bush we're getting from Lena. How different from the image that we've been getting just a moment ago, uh, no, actually just a moment later, um, from, from Armstead. Armstead knows exactly what Lucas is doing. He's running away from her. Um, and he's just really unlucky that he hasn't put the Mississippi River between himself and this woman. Um, so Armstead has a completely accurate diagnosis and portrait of what kind of a man Lucas Bush is. Lena has a completely unrealistic, out of touch with reality portrait of Lucas. She thinks that he'll be very glad to see her and that he'll be excited that in fact it's not just one person who's coming but two. Um, and so in many ways what Faulkner is giving us in this very stylized linguistic practice is to create a kind of ling linguistic cocoon around uh, Lena that she is insulated by this unidiomatic use of English just as she is insulated by an interpretation of reality that really has very little to do with the reality, with the truth about Lucas Bush. Um, it is very much a kind of linguistic shelter um, in which she can afford to keep on thinking in this way about the man who keeps running away from her. Um, and this is why she can afford and why can she be continue to be completely unworried, unanxious um, about her pregnancy. That that is just not this is what how she can avoid, she can prevent that from becoming a burden on her. Um, so we can think of this as one element, you know, Faulkner um, as various authors do intervene to make certain things possible for one character that would not be possible for other characters. And this particular intervention, the use of Jones, is one stylistic device to make sure that Lena is preserved um, in a state of constant well-being. So um, there, and but he's also clear-eyed enough to know that she really is completely dead wrong about Lucas Bush. So um, this is, sorry, fast forwarding to a much later moment. Um, but this is just to um, bring Faulkner into a discussion that we've been having all through the semester, which is about types, right? Whether um, certain pe people, characters, um, can be classified, they belong to broader groups, lab groups that have labels. Um, so it turns out that he's also uh, quite conscious of the fact that uh, Lucas Bush actually is not so much an individual um, as a type, a type of man. Um, and he, this is his commentary, uh, or this is actually Hightower's commentary, but it's as good as Faulkner's um, commentary on the fate of Lena Grove. For the Lena Groves, there are always two men in the world, and the number is legion. Lucas Bush's and Byron Bunches. You notice that all of them are suddenly appearing in the plural group. So Lena Grove herself is a type. They are the Lena Groves of the world. And then they are the Lucas Burgess and Byron Bunches. And this is really what saves Lena, is that she actually is one of the Lena Groves. And her fate um, is to be unlucky in one sense, in that she's stuck with a man like Lucas Bush. But she's lucky in the sense that you can just know, I mean, it's almost a kind of statistical point, that to every Lucas Bush, there will be a Byron Bunch who will take care <laughs> of her. So, you know, she's safe in this way that there will always be the pairing of two kinds of men in her life. Um, so here is, you know, the allegory, thick and fast. Um, Definitely very heavy-handed and meant to be noticed. Byron, Lord Byron, the you know stereotypical romantic uh, poet, um, and with the added little joke, I think that he actually died in Missolonghi, Italy. <laughs> so has some reference to has some affinity to Mississippi as well. I'm sure that it's not beyond Faulkner to think that that's a nice connection. Um, so. Um, 
it, um, the, so, so here's Byron you know, being the namesake for uh, uh, Byron Bunch. Um, and sure enough, he lives up to his namesake, the, 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 the uh, romanticism of his namesake. Um, then Byron fell in love. He fell in love contrary to all the tradition of his austere and jealous country raising, which demands in the object physical inviolability. It happens on a Saturday afternoon while he's alone at the mill. Two miles away, the house is still burning. The yellow smoke standing straight as a monument on the horizon. They saw it before noon when the smoke first rose above the trees, before the whistle blew and the others departed. I reckon Byron could too today, they said, with a free fire to watch. Um, the switchability is in high gear too, in here. Um, it starts out with Byron falling in love, but that romantic side of the story doesn't even get to control the entire paragraph. Um, basically, it just gets two sentences. Um, and then the rest of the paragraph is taken over by something that is, has nothing to do with romantic love. And all of a sudden, we realize that, yes, Byron is falling in love at the same time as a very, you know, that's dramatic enough in his life. Um, but this drama in Byron's life is taking part with a drama that's going to overtake the entire town, which is the burning of a house. Um, and it says something, and we're also getting another glimpse of what kind of people are living in this town um, in the reference to the free fire to watch. This is not the strangers who are kind to other strangers. It's a very different portrait of the local community. So um, it turns out that Byron is not the only a uh, person who has an allegorical name, but another character who does as well. It's a big fire, another said. What can it be? I don't remember anything coming out that way, big enough to make all that smoke except the burden house. Maybe that's what it is, another said. My pappy says he can remember how 50 years ago folks said it ought to be burned and with a little human fat meant to start it good. Maybe your pappy slipped up. They are in seven fire, and they said, they laugh. So this is the other allegorical name, is that Byron is always going to be paired with someone whose name is Burden. And Burden, while it's not as, you know, there's no Byron um, to clue us in, uh, there's actually a very famous poem that will su suggest to us the origins of that name, Kipling's poem, White Man's Burden take up the white man's burden and reap his own reward. The blame of those ye better, the hate of ye, of those ye got. Um, I think we have a completely misguided, wrong-headed notion, actually, of Kipling's white man's burden. It's not really about how great it is to take up the white man's burden, but how awful it is, and that you incur the hatred of lots of people. Um, so this is what um, the, what the allegorical names, um, how they function in Light in August, and how Faulkner is really updating the old classic story, is that it really is the story about the fate of someone called Byron and the fate of someone called Burden. And obviously, the other characters who uh, uh, invoke through those two characters, um, but they're both on fire. Byron is on fire because he's falling in love. Joanna Burden actually is on fire. <laughs> and that she's being burned alive. Oh, no, I mean she's dead by that point. But um, she's on fire. Her body's on fire. So um, she's, that is also what contributes to the light in all this. And that's why the other alternative title, Dark House, is just as appropriate.